Our scripture lesson for this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. In this scripture, Paul is addressing the reality of sin in our lives, but also is sharing a hopeful word of grace. Listen to these words from Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. And also from 1 John, which is a letter dedicated to proclaiming that God is love, we read these words, we love because he first loved us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've heard from the complaint department that I tell too many football stories. (laughs) And um, so today I want to do something different. And um, I could talk about hockey because the Stars just won the division. I could talk about golf because... It's the Masters and um, the best tournament of the year, in my opinion. But it's the beginning of baseball season. And um, so I, I've heard this in the past, and I, you know, I, I never thought I would quote George Carlin in a sermon. <laughs> but George Carlin, the late comedian, um, once compared baseball and football, See, working football in, but it's really to get to baseball. So here's the difference. There's the compar- comparison between football and baseball according to George Carlin. Baseball is a 19th century pastoral game. Football is a 20th century technological struggle. Baseball is played on a diamond in a park, the baseball park. Football is played on the gridiron in a stadium sometimes War Memorial Stadium or Soldier Field. Baseball begins in the spring, the season of new life. Football begins in the fall when everything is beginning to die. In football, you wear a helmet. In baseball, you wear a cap. Football is concerned with downs. What down is it? Baseball is concerned with up. Who's up? In football, you receive a penalty. In baseball, you make an error. Oops, I made an error. In football, the specialist comes in to kick. In baseball, the specialist comes in to relieve somebody. Football has hitting, clipping, spearing, piling on, personal fouls, late hitting, and unnecessary roughness. Baseball has the sacrifice. Football is played in any kind of weather, rain, snow, sleet, hail, or fog. In baseball, if it rains, we don't go out to play. (laughs) Baseball has the seventh inning stretch. Football has the two-minute warning. Baseball has no time limit. We don't know if it's going to end. Might have extra innings. Football is rigidly timed, and it will end even if we have to go to sudden death. In baseball, during the game in the stands, it's, there's kind of a picnic feeling. Emotions may run high or low, but there's not too much unpleasantness. In football, during the game in the stands, you can be sure that at least 27 times during the course of the game, you would be capable of taking the life of a fellow human being. <laughs> and finally, the objectives of the two games are completely different. 
In football, the object is for the quarterback, also known as the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with deadly accuracy in spite of the blitz, even if he has to use the shotgun. With short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory, balancing this aerial assault with a sustained ground game, ground attack that punches holes in the forward wall of the enemy's defensive line. In baseball, the object is to go home. (laughs) And to be safe. I hope I'm safe at home. That's the difference between football and baseball, according to George Carlin. And uh, again, I never thought I would quote George Carlin in a sermon. Just never occurred to me that that might happen, but it has. Well, I want to do some comparison today and really just some emphasis, because if you think about what makes our church different, how would you say our church is different than other churches? Well, in a lot of ways, there'd be a lot of similarities, but there's some things about our unique emphasis that would be different. And, and particularly as, as United Methodist Christians and, and in this church, we talk a lot about God's grace. And in this, this month of April, we're talking about how God's grace is enough. It's enough for all of us and, and how it's enough for all of our needs. And, and today I want to explore one realm of God's grace, because God's grace is, is multifaceted. In fact, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, talked about grace in different ways. He said it's one grace, but that grace is, is lived out, and in, in he used these big theological words that I'm going to try to explain a little bit, but um, prevenient grace, grace that precedes our conscious awareness, justifying grace when we're made right with God, And uh, sanctifying grace is is God's sustaining grace that helps us grow in in grace through our years. Um, Wesley used an image to convey that, and it was a house that you have the front porch, which is that that preceding grace, the grace before you ever come into the house, you come to know God's grace. There's the threshold of the door, and you enter into God's grace. You receive it or say yes to it, and then there's living in the house, which is the sustaining or, or sanctifying grace. Another image that I find helpful is that of, of a courtship, that, that prevenient grace is the courtship period where God is, is courting you and, and wooing you and, and sending you bouquets and flowers and, and, and ways of, of helping you understand that you are loved and that then the, the wedding is, is when it's official and you seal the deal and you say yes to this God who has already said yes to you. And then you live in the marriage uh, for the rest of your life. Uh, That relationship with God continues and deepens and grows and flourishes in in beautiful ways. And so those images I find helpful, but I wanna focus around that prevenient or preceding grace today because I I think if you're thinking about what does it mean to, to be enough, how do I know that my life is enough for God. Um, how do I know that, that I'm enough, that I'm, that I'm okay? I, mean, I, I think you have to go back to a basic understanding of, of God. And the reason I emphasize this, and, and I probably do it all the time, I don't know, if we do it, we probably can't do it enough in terms of this being the, a central emphasis of our church and our beliefs is that God is a God of grace. God is a God of grace. And I say that because that's not the message that is out there in the world necessarily about Christianity. And I think it's what makes our church distinctive and what gives, gives me hope that our church, not just, not just our church, but this message of grace could, could really make an impact in the world today because I think there's so much pain in the world today. There's so many people that are hurting so deeply. There's so many people that have never understood that they are loved 
and that God is a God of love who loves them, who only wants the best for their lives. The message that, that sometimes society has about Christianity and the Christian message is not a positive message. And to me, I think this is a very important message that we claim not just hear, but live and share in our own lives. So grace is, is um, enough. God's grace precedes our conscious awareness. Um, what we believe about grace is that grace is for all and grace is in all. Say that with me. Grace is for all and grace is in all. God's grace is working in your life from the very moment you're born. That God has been at work in your life trying to bring you into a relationship, trying to, to help you understand how deeply you are loved. Now, this, this gets played out in, in, in multiple ways, but I want to lift up several things this morning. One, one thing is that, that I think the Bible's trying to communicate to us about God's grace is that you and I were born in the image of a loving God. You and I were born into the image of a created by God, by a loving God, in God's image. I love what Genesis 1 says, God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, God created them. And God looked upon everything God had made and behold, it was very good. It was very good. Now often when people will talk about what it means to be a Christian, the first thing they talk about is that we're all sinners. That's the first thing out of the box when people talk about what, what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, first of all, we're all sinners. And our understanding of grace, before you talk about sin, you start at the beginning and you talk about this God in whose image you and I were made and created created by a loving God. Some of you have heard me share this before, but there's a contraction that was, you know, I, I've heard all my life, particularly when I was in Louisiana, but people would say, son, you're the spitting image of your father. They say it just like that too. Son, you are the spitting image of your father. Child, you're the spitting image of your mama. And um, spit and image, you know, is the word. Well, that word is a contraction. And the contraction is spirit and image. You are the spirit and image of your parent. And if you think about that in, in, in terms of our faith, you and I are the spirit and image of a loving God created in God's image, male and female, God created them. We are born in the spirit and image of God. You're the spit and image of God. You are the spirit and image of a loving God. That is to say that in each one of our lives, because God's grace is, is for all and in all, in each one of our lives, there is some resemblance to this God who loves us. Now, whether you can see that or not on a daily basis is, is, is a problem I think many of us have. And I, I, I long so much for people to get this um, about their lives. And I think especially if there are any um, children or teenagers here today, but adults need to hear this too. You, know, that you are loved by God. You were made in God's image and you are not nothing. And every time you feel insufficient, every time you feel like you're not enough, that's when you, you need to be reminded. I think God nudges us in different ways. That's what prevenient grace is about. It's God speaking to our heart through the Holy Spirit that our lives matter to God, that our lives have worth and value and I think so many people miss that. 
and it's all about what we've earned or what we've done to deserve it. And what grace is all about is about who God is and what God is doing. And none of us could ever earn it or deserve it. It is a gift that God has given to us. A gift to be received. So we, um, we focus on God's grace and that you were born and created in the image of a loving God. The second thing is that God desires a relationship with you. I mean, from the very beginning in the, in the scriptures, we're told that God is at work um, with, in a relational fashion, that God wants to relate to us. And the problem with our relationship with God is the problem of sin, that, that if you think of that, sin, what sin is, and a classical word for sin is, sin is separation from God. It's when we feel distant from God. It's usually because of, of choices that we've made, things that we've done, circumstances of our lives. We feel a separation from God. And, and what the Bible tells us is that God so loved the world. Are, are you in the world, by the way? Okay, so that includes you. I just want to make sure you understand this, this includes everyone here, right? And the whole world in general. That God so loved the world that God sent Jesus into the world to repair and restore this relationship. And that there's no way we could repair, restore that relationship on our own. But God has brought Jesus into the world through his love, that relationship is repaired and restored. And it's, it's putting our faith in him that, that brings us into that right relationship and restores that relationship in its proper image. And, and when we don't have that, we distort that image. It's not what it's supposed to be. I love what the Bible says about, about sin and grace. In, in Romans, it says, where, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. You get that? Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. God's got enough grace to cover your sin. God's got enough grace and if you feel separated from God, it doesn't mean that God has ever, ever stopped loving you. Because it's not in God's nature to ever stop loving you. You have always been loved and you will always be loved because God made you in God's image and God's desire is for a relationship with you. I love what Augustine said that, that that there's something within us that our souls do not find rest until they find their rest in thee. That, there, that we were made for this relationship and there's, there's something missing in our lives. And I think that's what prevenient grace, preceding grace is all about. It's, it's about nudging us to know there's something more. There's a God who wants to be in relationship with us some, some people have shared with me, I don't know why I came to church the first time. It just seemed like I needed something. I needed something. And I heard about this God, maybe that God's, God's love could help me. So there's something about that we are being led into that all of our lives, into this relationship. The last thing that I would share with you is that, that this is a gift to be received and that our part is not to earn our way into heaven. That's not what we do. We can't do that. Our part is to receive the gift. gift grace, at its, its root word, is, is charis, which means gift. Grace is a gift that's been offered to us by a God who loves us that much. And the only thing remaining when you've, when you've experienced that grace is will you receive it? And someone here thinking, well, this grace is great for other people, but it's not for me. And the, the Bible's very clear that this grace is for all. And it's what distinguishes our message and our church from, from some other churches. I will just say that, that we believe God's grace is in all and for all, our part is to receive it. Will you receive this gift? 
when I was in seminary, some of you have heard me tell this. I, I tell it often because it, to me it's the best illustration I know about um, what prevenient grace, preceding grace is all about. Um, and it was when I was in seminary, I was studying doctrine and my professor was, was a retired bishop, Bishop McFerrin Stowe. And Bishop Stowe was t- teaching our class about this concept of prevenient grace. And one student raised his hand and he said, Bishop, I don't understand what you're talking about. My head is spinning with all this, this theological talk. Tell us in simple terms, what is prevenient grace? What is this grace you're talking about? And he paused for a moment and he said that when he and his wife Twyla were newly married, within their first few years of marriage that they found out they were expecting a child and got so excited and fixed up the nursery and everything was building up for that big day. And, and then at, in the last month, something went wrong and they went to the hospital and this beautiful little girl was stillborn and their hearts were crushed. And after several days, they came back home and And they walked into the house and they walked into that nursery that they had prepared for that child. And Max Stowe said that his wife, Twyla, looked at him and she said, my arms literally ache to hold that child. My arms literally ache to hold that child. He said, now do you understand what grace is about. That you were created in the image of a God who longs to hold you. That God's arms ache to hold you because you are the, a child of God. He said, that's grace. Before we've done anything, God's grace has been there for us and will always be there for us. This is who we are. We're people of grace. We understand God as a loving God whose grace is at work in all and whose grace is for all. Let us pray. God, we do thank you so much for the gift of grace. And somehow in our lives as we try to figure out what life is about and what life means to us, your grace is enough, sufficient for all of our needs. I pray for that person here today, O oh Lord, who has never really felt that you love them, that they were good enough or that they deserved your grace. Remind them gently today through your Holy Spirit that grace is never deserved, but always freely given. You desire that for us. Lord, I pray that we would desire it also. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world to show us your love and grace. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of of salvation, which you freely offer to all who receive it. And I pray today that you again would speak to all of our hearts and remind us that we are created in your image. We are your children, loved by you. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.